Hello, this is Al Black and my, my co-host, Tim Conroy. Hello, Al. How you doing? Great. Our guest today on Chewing the Grizzle is Jennifer sang Ung Park. She earned her BA in English and BA in Communication Studies from the University of Colorado and her MFA in Poetry from the University of Alabama. Her first book, Autobiography of Horse, 2019, was selected as a co-winner of the Gaudy Boy Poetry Book Prize. Her essay, Yellow Like My Dad, shortlisted winner of the 2018 Under the Gum Tree Creative Nonfiction Prize. Her work can also be found in Mantis, Dragonald, Essay Press, Story South, Mid-American Review, and elsewhere. She's currently working on a collection of poems and essays about her experiences as a first-generation Korean-American and small fictions that reimagine her mom as a Mindy that could have been. She's also working on a thing that interrogates how exams, tests, and assignment, assessments measure aptitude in ways that are limited and limiting. Originally from Denver, Jennifer lives in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, teaches creative writing, first year writing, and literature at the University of Alabama. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Tim, for having me. I'm so excited to chat with y'all. I'm going to get to our questions. I, I uh, actually turned to one of your poems. By the way, it's a, it's a great poem. If I don't oh. know if you'll read it today, but Public Mourning is just a beautiful poem. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Tell us about your poetry journey and education, and who was it that encouraged you early on to be a poet? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. It's going to bring back a lot of nostalgia. Um, so I was always interested in writing, um, whether that be essays for class or a sonnet that I write um, in the cubicle at our high school library alone during lunchtime. I always found that writing was um, a way of documenting whatever I was going through that day, but also an opportunity for me to think of what, or not think of, but process um, those emotions and feelings and experiences that I couldn't really articulate verbally. So writing is something that I always loved and found a lot of um, comfort in. But it wasn't until undergrad um, when I realized that I really wanted to pursue poetry in the sense that I wanted to practice poetry and develop my own poetic processes and figure out how to get my poems out in the world. And so, and the biggest figure um, in my life during that time as a student uh, was Jake Adam York who um, taught me that on one level, of course, poetry is lyrical. It's the lyric where you can share your intimate self, but it can also do more than that. It can connect with someone beyond who you are. It's a way to ask questions and invite people to possibly rethink what they're going through or find comfort with you on the page. So I then started thinking about how to go beyond myself as a poet and did a lot of research. So research is a lot of, it's a big thing in um, a lot of the per, uh, poetry that I do. And finding a way, I think the most fun that I have when I write poetry is finding a form 
that um, lets me play around with the research um, that I've discovered or a form that allows me to ask questions beyond myself. Wonderful. Tim, what do you have for her? Well, you know, I wanted, I think your um, chat book that I looked at was so creative, but I want to ask you specifically about the full length collection and tell us a little bit about how that was born in your imagination. Excellent question, Tim. Um, so the, the book and the chat book in question is um, about an idea of horses and like many other ideas it starts as a tiny seed so it started with oh wow horses are really interesting animals what else can i learn about them and it turned into this really strange obsession where i discovered um sort of like the caverns of horse history and horse information I was really drawn to the, the really bizarre facts or um, ideas that we have about the horse, whether that is a fear of the horse or how um, so some cultures use or um, eat horse meat and all these other strange things. Um, but the, I think the interesting thing about that researching process is that it happened when I was um, going through a really difficult time with my depression. So um, with that period in my life, I had a really hard time just talking to anyone. So then I put all that pressure in wanting to talk to someone or wanting to <clears throat> articulate how I was feeling on the horse. So this image, this thing that started as a seed of like, wow, horses are really cool, um, became um, a vessel for me to understand my depression and work through it. It's like the horse became my um, strangest, but bestest friend during this period. So the book is about that journey, about learning all these things about the horse, but also processing um, my depression at that time. No, I, I really appreciate that response. And, it, and, you know, before I ask my next question, why don't you read uh, something, a selection from uh, your book? Yeah. <clears throat> I will... Um, read a little bit from the beginning, um, just a couple short little paragraphs. According to Korean superstition, a weak person is more likely to be inhabited by a spirit than a person of stronger character. And in Korean, mar means horse. Mar also means word, speech and utterance. This is some kind of destiny. I crushed hard in the beginning. The horse was an answer to each prompt. In the horse's body, I saw the possibilities of my own body. In the horse's past, I saw my own past. The horse understood me and I wanted to share this oblivion. There was no human to share it with. I shared a mirror with the horse. So did, when you wrote your chapbook, did you know at that time you wanted that to become uh, a full length poetry book? Or you know, was that still forming? It, um, at the time that Essay Press decided to um, publish that chapbook, I did submit the full manuscript to them. So it was in um, a book form, albeit like with the um, editing help that I had from G and the Ghani Boy Press. Um, it was a slightly different form. But what I submitted to Essay Press was the complete book. 
Um, but of course, before that, it was like much larger and um, it took a different shape prior to when I was sending it out for publication. Jennifer, I selfishly want you to read another selection from, from <laughs> that book because I absolutely want to tell the listeners they need to buy Autobiography of Horse. It's one of the most imaginative poetry collections I've read in a long time. So please read another selection. Well, thank you, Tim. Thank you. And I'm glad you brought up the word imaginative because so much of this book is about how, at least for me, um, how much can I push my own imagination and trying to make this thing, which was the horse, come alive to me when I so desperately needed it to come alive for me. Um, so, right, so I will read a portion about the OMAC suicide race. In the OMAC suicide race, horses and the riders have 50 feet to rush, then sprint, 500 yards down Suicide Hill, a rise grinning with a 60 degree slope. After successfully sprinting down the hill, the horse and rider must cross the Okanagan River. After the sloppy 50 yard swim, the horse and rider climb out to speed toward the finish line. Excited spectators eagerly greet the drenched and dirty survivors. Some horses fall and roll to the bottom of the hill or, unable to grasp their breath or footing, sink and disappear into the river. Other horses die during training, in practice trials or after completing the race. Though the race began in 1935, only 21 deaths have been accounted for in the last 25 years. Thank you. Brother Al. When you're writing, how much time do you spend on revision? And when do you know that a poem is finished? <laughs> that, that's a big question, yeah. I am not one admittedly, who has ever been good with building a healthy habit of writing every day, which is something that I've embraced. Um, I think a lot of like young writers feel like they have to write every single day that um, if they don't, that they'll lose that sense of craft or they'll fall behind. And certainly writing every single day can help you um, be a better writer in the sense that it is very much like um, being an athlete. Like you got to work out, you got to practice. Um, but at the same time, I think it's okay to give ourselves grace to be um, just simply open to feeling that sort of intuitive pull to write something and to just use that pull to write whatever you need to write. So in terms of how and when I write, I write when I just feel like I have to do it. And um, it's a really hard thing to explain, but um, whenever that happens, and of course it's very sporadic, I don't know when inspiration will come or when I'll feel that intense hunger to write. Whenever that happens, I'll just, it just spills over. Um, and um, I, in terms of revisions, I revise while I write. So um, I will oftentimes just write out a bunch. Um, I like to call it sort of like word vomiting. And as I'm writing it, I'll go back and then forward. And um, it's a very non-linear process for me. Um, but of course there are moments where I have to write something and just forget about it, which is okay too, is to turn your back to it um, and then come back to it at a later time and then revise it with renewed eyes. So I do that too. But mostly it's a lot of like 
spillage and me looking, scavenging through the spillage while it's spilling and then piecing together something that feels right. And then um, allowing that to sit for a little bit. And um, if I feel like I want someone else to see it, I sort of use that as a sign like, okay, maybe it's ready to be active in the world. Maybe I can send it out. Maybe I can at least share it with a friend. Wonderful. So is a poem ever finished? Or do you publish it and then read it later and go, oh, and change it? <laughs> That's something that I've learned a lot about after I published um, Autobiography, of course, is like, what happens after this is made into this concrete thing someone can hold is um I learned like maybe like the most magical thing about publishing is that the book lives on through someone else and um it's it's so interesting to see how others have reacted to the book and what they took away from it and um, that's like the best thing about letting this work go out into the world and seeing how it becomes this organic living thing beyond yourself because someone else is reading it and someone else is enacting their own imagination um, with like the past version of who you are. Um, so I don't think anything we write is ever finished because it'll just keep taking on new lives. It'll just reincarnate um, in someone else's hands. Tim. That's a profound way to answer that question. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I have asked everyone that we've interviewed is how do you work through mediocrity? How do you work through rejection uh, to get better? And even how you work through success. So <laughs> take that the way you will and respond. Yeah. So in order to respond to that question, I want to like respond as like the younger Jennifer, as like the one who's, emerging the ones who's just trying um and it it's a lot of um it can be really heartbreaking to send out a poem or send out your work and it not um it be being it being rejected um and i think there's a lot of truth in the power of just trying, maintaining some kind of persistence. Um, because I, I mean, this might be a little romantic, but I, I, I truly believe that the people who were meant to see your work and the people who are meant to shepherd your work into its published form exist. And it, when you send your work out there, it's just a matter of it landing in that person's um, lap. Um, so just pushing through all of those rejections, um, just trying and trying um, is what has kept me going and what has motivated me to not take it personally if I get rejected and to rephrase it so it's like, oh, it's just, they just didn't see um, what I wanted, what I hoped to see. Um, and it's like a careful balance of like, of course, like being humble, um, but also being self-assured um, that you have something to say. And certainly someone will put that microphone up to what you want to say. Um, 
in terms of medi- mediocrity, um, I think that's something that we all fear as poets, um, especially because there's so much great poetry out there and um, it's a marketplace and we have to like think of how we can compete with those other voices. Um, but I think the danger of thinking in terms of like, oh, how can I stand out even more is um, you don't portray like your genuine self in your writing. And I think remembering that all of us have our own unique perspectives and experiences and believing in your own experience is what can help you not think about those concerns and just end up writing what you really need to write and what you feel compelled to write. And how about if we hear two more um, selections of your unique voice? (laughs) Thank you, Tim. Um, So I'll read um, that poem, Al, that you mentioned earlier, Public Morning, um, and a little poem from the autobiography of Horace. Public Morning. When I left for Alabama, I was told Southern families are much like Korean families. And though I didn't know exactly what was meant by this, I agreed. The first time I saw a magnolia tree in complete blossom, I didn't know what it was. Each magnolia, a skull dropped and smooth in the river. Each petal, a ladle for a milky stew. The expanse of the flower, an expanse of a snowy field. I cradled one back to rest in a jar. I admit, I'm interested in the most effective ways to delete my body. It's an obsession with conclusions. Chemical, I'm advised to think. Sickness. There was a single flower out of many. I loved it incredibly. I forget each thing I put in a jar is destined to die quickly. I left the house with the plan. Inside the magnolia are chemicals that defend against bacteria. Inside a schedule for saving. I remind myself I'm innately equipped. I watch the magnolia rust before I threw it away, cracking between my fingers. It left a trail from the table to the trash can. In Korea, we bury our dead under mounds. These bulbs pimple the countryside. I've seen people dressed in white standing over a mound, magnolias crying over their fruit. I was disappointed in the magnolia's lack of resistance. It should have lived so much longer, though detached from its source. I can't forgive myself for going against nature, for carrying inside a whiteness for dying. That is great. Thank you. Should I read the other little poem from Mono? Okay. Please do. So in this, um, in this book, I stitched together a bunch of different forms, and one of the sort of lines or thread lines are these little, these tinier poems that are scattered throughout the book. The red horse wears a saddle made of my bones, slings my limp casing over his back, takes me to a hill, rears to drop me. My eyes fall out and tumble into my mouth. He pours gasoline over me and lights the night. That's... uh... Very short, but very powerful poem. Thank um, you, Al. Uh, almost like a pyre or a, uh, <laughs> Yeah. What poets or individuals are influencing or fueling your imagination at this time? Oh, that's a great question. So I don't, I mean, I can't think of like a specific poet or writer right now um but what I've been more interested in in terms of the writing that's happening for me um are the members of my nuclear family so I'm trying to find 
a lot of the poems that I'm writing right now are um, inspired by conversations I've been having with my mom and my grandma. So I'm like sort of, maybe it's a regression of some sort, um, but I'm, I've been more interested or drawn to writing alongside the voices that I, the voices that made up my home. So thinking about how um, I can sort of reanimate my mom in a different way through my poems and also how I can write poetry that I can share with my grandma. So I haven't really been doing a lot of reading in terms of poetry, but I think it's, it's intentional in the sense that I want to like learn more from these um, matriarch in my family um, and not let other um, points of interest or inspiration like dilute that um, that sort of project that I've been working on. Do you have resources or practices that you use to keep yourself animated and, and or that you would recommend to a student? Yeah, yeah. One thing that I love to do and find really productive and like the one habit that I've managed to maintain <laughs> is journaling and that seems like such a simple thing but it helps me a lot in just logging whatever i'm thinking especially when i journal um early in the morning that seems to be the best time for me to um collect a lot of thoughts so journaling's great because it's uninhibited there's no like end goal to it, which I think is great. It's just a way for you to dump a lot of your thoughts. And I go back to these journals. I've like, I have dozens of full journals throughout like, from like high school up to now um, that I still go back to and pull material from. So keeping just like this low stakes place for you to write in, I think is a good way to, you know, keep active and animated um, without the pressure of having to produce a poem poem. Jennifer, um, let me ask you in terms of craft, in terms of the poetic elements you tend to rely on, mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about the ones you love to use and the ones you like to not use, you know, <laughs> kind of kind of talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I really like juxtaposition. Um, I love playing with um, the reader's expectations. Um, I love in that juxtaposition, so like taking one thing, but like flipping it, um, twisting how we see things. I love doing that. And I find um, it allows me to like play around with um, lines more. It allows me to play around with language even more. Um, one thing that I don't really enjoy doing or don't feel super inclined to do is um and i know it's a really common thing but i don't really like rhyming um i like to look at the sound of words um from different places i like to um think about how especially in terms of language um with the korean language and the english language how there might be some overlaps or conflicts in sound in that way. Hey, before we finish up, I'm gonna ask you uh, a last, maybe two more questions and get you to read two poems. Mm -hmm. uh, but what are you working on now? Your project, that in, I know you've kind of gone into that a little bit, but tell us a little bit more. And what's the best way for people to get a copy of your book? Yeah, so 
um, first, um, the book is available for um, purchase, if you will, through major booksellers. I know Singapore Unbound, which is the website that Gaudy Boy Press um, uses or houses their press in, has links to indie publishers. So if you feel inclined to purchase this book, um, I do encourage everyone to support our small booksellers. And uh, I guess going back to the other questions, the two projects I'm working on, um, I'm trying to reimagine my mom in what I call small fiction. So thinking about what would her life have been like had she not married and had children and pursued the careers that she originally attended, intended to when she moved to America. Um, and the other project is um, taking exam questions and exam setups, so like common exams like the SAT or the ACT or the exam one would take to um, become a naturalized citizen and um, sort of messing them up with my own um, answers to those questions. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. And, and uh, please read a couple more selections uh, for us and our listeners. Okay, I'd love to. Um, read a couple section, a couple more sections from the horse book. In a photo, the body of a horse with a malignant tumor is cut for wolf feed. Hung from the neck, the body hangs on a scaffold of three wooden poles peaked into a tripod. The horse's rigid head faces west. A bloated tongue limps out of his mouth. Behind the hanging horse is a parched tree, and behind this tree is a ditched school bus. Below, a man wearing glasses, a brown tank top, and a pair of light jeans, whole at the knee, bends to strip the meat from the hindquarters. Beside him, a wooden box where the cuts of meat will be preserved. The main cascades the same shade of dusty blonde as the man's ponytail. If the photo were cropped, it'd be a still of a rearing stallion. The horse's eyes, are shut for the pleasure of being carved for another animal. Wow, the ending of that poem. Thank you. Um, and another short one. Some explanations on why I write about horses. One, I just think horses are cool. Two, I was tired of seeing the sky in your eyes. Three, at the end, there was a question mark. Four, I got lost on my way home. Five, the mirror needed fixing. Six, because the past is more uncertain than the future. Seven, my body is too small for my body. Eight, no other mask seemed to fit. Nine, I was jealous. 10, I shipped my heart out and needed a replacement. 11, I was playing the longest game of hide-and-seek. Twelve, I came upon a fortress and the door was locked. Thirteen, I was experimenting with renewable energy sources. Fourteen, my grandma is a horse. Fifteen, my horse is not my grandma. Sixteen, I am the Judas horse. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, we're coming to an end, and we really want to thank the poet, Jennifer sang Um Park. We encourage you to, to find her online, as well as buy her book, Autobiography <laughs> of Horse. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Tim, for allowing me to just chat with y'all. This has been a great joy. I appreciate it.